Um, I work for the Eden Project currently, um, but I have worked um, with many of the panellists for many years in various guises, so this is like coming back home. If you'll indulge me just for one minute, we're here to talk about carbon and how, as farmers, we can uh, be better stewards of carbon. But I thought I might just say very briefly how and why someone like Eden fits into the picture. Because I think this is a very interesting conference where we seem to have brought a lot of connections back together. Um, and I think Eden, perhaps as a, as a new part of, of um, the environmental movement, really, is, is an area where we can perhaps engage with different audiences and, and begin to tell the story to many members of the public in a different way. So Eden, I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's in Cornwall, and it's basically a very large, beautiful garden which has been uh, built in a quarry. And it symbolises regeneration and transformation. And what we do there is basically through the stories of plants, um, engage people both with the living world and with each other. So in some ways it fits very well with this conference. And the way we do that particularly is through telling stories. We're not trying to show and tell, what we're trying to do is engage people and through stories, particularly about plants, um, evoke curiosity and stimulate questions. And I think what I'd hope from this session is that Although we're primarily talking about hard, the hard facts of farming and carbon and how we can actually manage to achieve change, I'd quite like us to also think about how we do that and how we can actually engage people and get them to care about what we're doing, because otherwise we're just simply debating facts, many of which we all know the facts, but how do we actually get the, the, uh, the changes that we need to see through people properly understanding and then actually being willing to care about the issues. So I'd quite like that to be part of the conversation, but firstly we've got three very um, eminent speakers, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves, but first of all we've got Craig, who has got many different hats, but here primarily I would imagine to talk with his carbon gold hat on, but also has been a very long-standing member of the Soil Association and found the Queen of Black's Chocolate and has done many other things. And what I'm going to do is each speaker is going to speak for about 15 minutes and then that will leave us with at least half the session to have a, what I hope will be a dialogue and a conversation rather than just questions and answers. So Craig, over to you first of all and thank you. Thank you Charlotte. I've titled this talk Getting Back to the Garden and the garden is, in fact, the Garden of Eden, if not the Eden Project itself. Uh, I took that from a uh, Joni Mitchell song. We are stardust, we are golden, we are billion-year-old carbon, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. When she says we're billion-year-old carbon, we are. In this room alone, there is just in the people here, uh, uh, just under a ton of billion-year-old carbon. Each of you embodies about 18 kilos, so I've done the maths. Um, and then there's all the carbon in the floors, there's a bit of carbon in the air, there'll be more by the time we finish. Um, carbon's always there, and it's always been there. Well, it hasn't always been there, because billions of years ago, it wasn't there. That's just a rough estimate. We're oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, that's most of what we are. So our protein is carbon, our fat is carbon, our starch is carbon, it's all carbon. Fred Hoyle, the uh, astrophysicist, set out the idea of stellar nucleogenesis. That's that electrons, uh, well, that atoms like carbon are created in stars. The cooler part of the star is hydrogen, then there's oxygen, there's carbon, then the star explodes, and as it explodes as a supernova, out come things like gold <coughs> and uranium. But, and then that all blows out into space. And Fred also had, Fred Hoyle had the idea of panspermia, which is that life is actually everywhere in its most primitive forms. On Earth, that was 
in stones, lithoplast and spermia, little fungal microorganisms that struggled along, nibbling away at the bits of carbon that were in rocks like limestone, calcium carbonate. And then something happened, a miracle. A cyanobacteria emerged that could convert carbon from our 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere back in the day and convert it into carbohydrate using oxygen, but using water and sunlight. And those microorganisms very quickly were organized, I would argue, by the fungi in the world into chain gangs and eventually into what we know as plants, waving around, ga gathering carbon from the air, turning it into carbohydrate or sugar, and feeding it to their microbial, micro, my, their fungal masters, which we know as mycorrhizal fungi. So gradually, as the soil built up, as these microbes died and were reborn and died, and all the carbon kept cycling and cycling, more and more of that carbon that was in the atmosphere ended up in the soil. And that's the soil that we inherited as human beings because eventually there was so little carbon in the atmosphere that we could evolve. I was born in Nebraska, in the green part up there. When my great-grandfather plowed the virgin prairie back in 1885, there were 100 tons of carbon per hectare on our farm. By the time I was born, there were 10. The rest had gone up in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, and that was a major contributor. At, at that period, farming had contributed more carbon dioxide to global warming than industry. Since then, it's changed slightly. We were frugal people. Flower companies sold flour in calico bags. When the bag was used, it would be washed out and turned into a dress for the kids. The smart flower companies realized this and started printing, printing pretty patterns on their flower bags. And that's my mom and her sister Thelma on the farm with a calico uh, dress made out of a Nelrose flower bag. Their husbands were just as frugal, but they didn't realize that they were destroying this million year multi heritage of carbon that was in their soil. As Wendell Berry put it, we didn't know what we were doing because we didn't know what we were undoing. But once we had undone all that <coughs> carbon, once that carbon was gone from the soil, it lost its water holding capacity, it lost its structural integrity, it just fell apart. The Mississippi floods, the Mississippi was 60 miles wide from April till October in 1927. It kicked off the great migration. Six million African Americans ended up in northern cities, wiped out of the farms that they received after the end of the Civil War. Then it was the Okies' turn. The Dust Bowl, the soil just blew away up to even western Nebraska, and the solution was very simple. Plant trees. Richardson Barr Baker founded Men of the Trees, was a founder member of the Soil Association, helped President Roosevelt to build this Civilian Conservation Corps that planted three million men, planted 10 billion trees all down the dusty part of the United States to try and get the grip on that soil and rebuild the soil structure. But the other problem was tractors. And tractors enabled farmers to plow twice as deep as a horse-drawn plow could do. So on our farm, we still used horses for planting, but for plowing, it was tractors, and the tractors churned up those last residues of fertility as carbon, and that uh, just took it down from 10 parts to five. Eve Balfour wrote The Living Soil, trying to get the message across that this was insane. She hooked up with Innes Pierce, who had shown that good nutrition could transform people's lives, and they formed the Soil Association, which was based on those two parallel theories, healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy people, and healthy animals, of course. In 1966, I came to England, to London, to open a macrobiotic restaurant. I imported a book called Zen Macrobiotics, which embodied the philosophy I'd adopted a year earlier. And Zen is kind of the Zen Japanese Buddhist version of Taoism. So we were into yin and yang. Uh, we opened a restaurant called Seed, 
And it set out this fairly simple message, eat whole grains, exercise, oops, I need to be one behind myself. Uh, food is the key to health, and uh, we introduced Japanese foods like miso, nori, that sort of thing. We were very uh, wedded to the idea that this was an Eastern philosophy. Reading the Prince of Wales' book, I realized uh, in a moment of you know, realization that we were uh, just not, had, weren't aware of our own Western culture. And the Prince wrote about the Stoics. They held that it's our duty to achieve an attunement between human nature and the greater scheme of the cosmos. The Taoism of China and the Vedic tradition of India also operate from this point of view. And in fact, when I mentioned it to His Royal Highness on Sunday night, he said, well, actually, it wasn't the Stoics. It started in Egypt. But that's a small technical point. We launched a company we called Yin Yang Limited, and our first product was brown rice. We used a yin yang sign with a leaf and a branch. And that carried on, and then we couldn't use the whole earth, the Harmony brand anymore because it was registered in other countries as we became international. So we launched a brand that we relaunched as Whole Earth, still trying to keep that holistic concept. Our cornflakes were organic, whole grain, and carbon neutral. And what we discovered when we launched the cornflakes and had the carbon footprinting done that actually we didn't have to plant very many trees at all because every year all of the carbon emissions of the farming, of the transportation, of the processing, of the packaging, and the distribution to retailers, our total carbon footprint was almost entirely offset by the increase in soil organic matter on the farms in France, the organic farms, that grew the corn. So that was a kind of revelation for me. The UN have said we only have 60 years of farming left if we don't change our ways. Volker Engelsmann is here and uh, was the uh, president of iPhone, runs the Elsta, said we have, we're losing 30 football fields a minute. I challenged him on it yesterday. He's absolutely rock solid on the mats. I trust him. That's what soil looks like the day before, the year before it's useless. There's an effort to unlock market systems to deal with land, to create, to achieve land degradation, neutrality. Well, ladies and gentlemen, neutrality is not enough. We have to regenerate. Regeneration International is uh, part of the movement. They were in Marrakesh supporting the French, but there are many other organizations now, Soil Association, FEFAO, etc., that are working to turn this process around, stop losing 30 football fields a minute. None of those football fields are organic farms. Industrial farms burn carbon 12 calories of fossil fuel to produce one calorie of food. Organic farms aren't that much better. Well, they're twice, half as bad, twice as good. They use six calories to produce a calorie of food. A farmer with a hoe, can produce 20 calories of food with one calorie of their own energy. Somewhere in there, there is a sweet spot. The Rodale Institute uh, has done their 30-year, it's now 34-year farming system trial that validates that organic farming increases soil carbon and reduces emission and loses less energy. Stéphane Le Foll, the French agriculture minister two years ago, stated that we could completely offset the annual increase in global greenhouse gas simply by changing the way we farm and increasing soil organic matter. He presented it to the French National Assembly and they voted through a uh, 65 euro a ton price on carbon to kick in by 2020 and to apply to everything. Now that's what parliaments do in practice. It will probably take a lot longer, but at least they've set a course. The French then introduced at Paris and consolidated at Marrakesh their four per thousand initiative, which basically quantified what Stéphane Le Foll said. If we could increase soil organic matter by four parts per thousand every year, that would offset the annual increase in global greenhouse gas emissions. 
Is that a difficult or challenging target? What are those emissions? Prince of Wales wrote a Ladybird book, most of you may have read Harmony, but you may not have read that book, in which he set out this very simple graphic that shows where those 16 billion tons of carbon come from. And because the Earth is always capturing carbon in biomass, the sea is absorbing carbon, but the net increase is this 16 billion tons that a four part per thousand increase in soil organic matter would offset. Last year, Prince Albert of Monaco hosted a think tank at a farm in Italy called La Viala, a biodynamic farm. The University of Siena checks their soil carbon every year and they found that the La Viala is sequestering seven parts of organic matter per thousand every year. If everybody farmed like La Viala, we would actually be reducing the atmospheric greenhouse gas by 12 billion tons every year. And that's before you factor in solar, wind, insulation, all the other actions that people are taking. In 2008, the Prince of Wales gave a talk at Mansion House to a bunch of bankers and the financiers, most of whom were worried about whether they'd find their doors padlocked the following morning. Um, and he said, we're losing 15 football pitches every minute. So there's a process. First you lose the forest, then you lose the land. And he pointed out that a hectare of rainforest at the then carbon price of $20 a ton was worth $15,000. It was being chopped down to create soybean land that was worth $300 a hectare. So as he put it, it's the biggest example of market failure in the history of capitalism. Well, don't rely on President Trump to do anything about it, but at a corporate level, people like General Mills have just, uh, will have 100,000 hectares of their supply chain organic by 2020, and that's how they're planning to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. We have to stop burning food. We still think that biofuels are a sensible option. And Europe has an obligation that you have to burn rapeseed oil or palm oil to comply with your uh, renewable fuels obligation. Half of the United States corn crop every year is converted into ethanol and burned. And we have to stop burning wood. It's the biggest pollutant, polluting fuel of all. It's even worse for people's breathing and uh, respiration than coal or oil or gas, and yet every year 200,000 wood-burning stoves are sold to people in this country who think they're being virtuous while they're actually uh, responsible for at least 4,000 premature deaths a year. What can we do with all that woody biomass? We can turn it into biochar, we can turn it into charcoal, or we can use it to build to construct, there are now ways of processing wood that give it more resilient strength than steel and more supportive strength than concrete. So it's the building, and then when you, I live in a house that's 250 years old. It's all wood, wood floorboards, wood structure. It'll be there for at least another 100 or so years. There's no reason, it would just last forever. Biochar in the soil increases the soil microbial population by anything from 10 to 100 times. It, that increase in soil population is part of the plant's immune system. It's also part of the plant's nutrient supply system. So it enhances fertility while it repels pathogenic types of fungi and bacteria that really should only be attacking dead plants. It has a high surface area, uh, so it adsor adsorbs nutrients, so when it rains, nitrates and phosphates don't wash out of the soil. You, at the moment, in industrial <coughs> farming, half of all nitrates just wash away and turn into nitrous oxide. So it can reduce fertilizer use and it helps soils to retain moisture. Organics are, uh, most people don't like to talk about their yield increases in case a supermarket hears about it but uh, Oyershot Organics were quite proud of their 10 to 15% yield increases 
from putting biochar in the soil. They only have to do it one year, then it stays there, continuing to improve soil quality year after year. It's also used in uh, field cropping as well as in propagation. So a lot of uh, propagators in Holland use it in propagating plants that go to non-organic greenhouses because they're supplying more vigorous, darker green plants. In Belize, uh, Kraft purchased 10 kilns to enable the farmers in Belize to make their own biochar. It's been transformative. They now have nine nurseries producing 5,000 trees each per year. They've expanded their agroforestry system, cocoa production dramatically. It's been a real change. Sweden has built their own biochar production facility outside of the city. So all their green waste goes into it, is transformed into biochar. At the moment, we still supply them with biochar because they haven't quite got that up and running. Every time they plant a tree, uh, a third of the growing medium that the tree goes into is biochar. It ain't easy being an urban tree, but that makes a big difference to tree survival. It also works in extremely hot countries. In Qatar, the Aspire Park brings specimen trees from all over the world for this beautiful park in Doha. Um, and the trees die. So they've started using biochar because it increases the water holding capacity of the soil around the tree, increases the resilience of the tree. How do we get, you can't exhort people to do something, how do we get people to stop burning carbon back into the atmosphere and start keeping it in the ground? The maths are there, it's simple, but we still have EU regulations and other things that encourage uh, the wrong behavior. We need carbon markets. We need to pay people who capture carbon two ways. One is for every time they put a ton of carbon into the ground that they get paid for it. So the farmer is rewarded for sequestering carbon. If a farmer is emitting carbon and reducing soil carbon levels, then they should, be, then they should pay the price of whatever it is they've wasted. Then pay the farmer a interest payment on the amount of carbon in the soil. It's unfair for an organic farmer who has been building up soil carbon to only get paid for the increase. They need to be paid for the amount that's actually in the soil. The impact on an industrial farm would be approximately, it all depends on soil type and crop type and everything else, but would be roughly at 20 euros a ton, 100 pounds a hectare, that would be the cost of industrial farming and a benefit to an organic farmer of about 100 tons a hectare. The impact on food prices would be that organic food would be cheaper than non-organic food because it would be uh, benefiting from the carbon benefit that its sequestration delivers. So to go back to Joni, we are stardust, we are golden, we are billion or year old carbon. Carbon goes anywhere we want it to go. It's up to us. If Goldman Sachs and the Cargill and the big traders, the people who make money out of trading commodities, if carbon became a fungible, tradable commodity, it would be a $2 trillion a year business. Copper is a $250 million a year commodity trade. It's, it would be one of the biggest commodity trades of all. All we have to do is get there, but I think, personally, capitalism could be the answer. All we have to do is put a value on carbon and we can get back to the garden. Thank you. Well, I think we've got the basis of an interesting discussion today because some of what I'm going to say will very much complement what Craig has been saying and a few things will actually challenge you. So uh, maybe, you know, there's going to be a bit of an interest there. Um, I mean, it is worth making the point that carbon is the basis of all life on Earth. And given what's happening about climate change, where the carbon that we're putting out in the atmosphere <coughs> is the principal cause of global warming and climate change, I think the question we have to actually recognise is that carbon could also be the basis of the end 
of all life on Earth, or at least all life uh, that we're particularly interested in, including us as a human race. And there's, of course, there's a harmony in that. You, you know, life and death, why shouldn't that happen? And if we are so irresponsible as to use carbon in that um, irresponsible way, then really that's the harmony that nature will bring about. Just a quick point, because I won't have time to mention it later, on Craig's mention of carbon taxes. I, I, what I would recommend is a tax on nitrogen fertiliser and a subsidy on carbon, which I think would work better. Now, I think it's also just making the point about organic chemistry, because there's a lot of confusion about carbon in the soil. There's carbon in the soil exists in two forms, inorganic carbon and organic carbon. And quite sometimes people report the full carbon analysis of soil, which includes the inorganic carbon. It's only really the organic carbon. Carbon is an inert element, unless it combines with oxygen or hydrogen primarily, a few other elements, but those are the two, which makes it, uh, if, if you get a reaction then, and you get uh, carbon dioxide, or you get um, the hydrocarbons like methane and, 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 and so on. And that's really the same as with nitrogen. Nitrogen in the air is inert unless it combines with oxygen or hydrogen and then it becomes reactive and that is contributing to climate change too. Um, I think also just remember that organic carbon is the key point we're talking about here and that's really, we're also, you know, organic farming is an attempt to actually work with carbon in a more uh, constructive way. And I've just put this slide on here to make a little point. <coughs> grassland is really the basis, grassland with legumes in, of organic farming systems. Lot, there are some horticultural systems that can potentially exist without that. But the only way that you can produce food from grassland is if you graze it with ruminants. And we've got a major campaign being launched by well-meaning food groups and environmental groups around the world who believe that ruminants, because they produce methane, are the, the species that we should be cutting back on and getting rid of. But if we do that, we actually get rid of them. We're not producing food on that grassland. It's the only way we can get food from that grassland. In the UK, actually 71% of the, the farmland in the UK, if you include, co include common land and rough grazing, is, is, is grassland. And if we were to plough that up to try to grow crops, we'd have an environmental disaster, both in terms of soil erosion and in terms of the greenhouse gases released to the environment. And the key point here is what's been happening because of the misguided campaigns is we've been moving from consuming animal fats, which 50 to 100 years ago, we got virtually all our dietary fats from farm animals in the form of dairy products or um, animal fats. And we've been moving to getting them from vegetable oils. For the vast majority of people, that means palm oil, and which now accounts for 56% of all the, the fats consumed worldwide, and soybean oil. And that's leading to huge environmental destruction of rainforests and loss of species in Southeast Asia, South America, and now most recently in the central part of Africa because we've got an insatiable growing demand for, for these vegetables. Uh, just to go on with Craig's point, just a quick look at timescales. The Earth was formed from hot gases about four and a half billion years ago, and of course that's where the carbon came from. Um, that, the, the, the atmosphere was completely uninhabited, in, inhospitable at that time. The Carboniferous era, um, 400 to 300 million years ago, billion, million years ago, um, took a huge amount of carbon and sulphur out of the atmosphere and laid it down in fossil fuels in the, car the coal, the gas and the oil that we've been using in the last 400 years. And really the, the root cause of the problem is that we've been taking that carbon which had been put away, it's deep underground, we've been taking it out and we've been trying to put it all back into the atmosphere in just 400 years instead of 400 million years. Um, about 300 million years ago, the first reptiles with some mammalian species started, features started to emerge. Uh, 200 million years ago, we had the first mammals emerging. They didn't really get terribly far until the dinosaurs disappeared. And then from about 65 million years ago to now, we've really had the era um, of, of, of mammals when we, they thrived and, and, and expanded. And just in the last 2 million years, we as a human species have emerged. 
Um, the, just a very quick, uh, obvious sort of thing about the, the, the carbon cycle here. Um, soil organic matter being a, a, the key to fertile food production and it, it affects soil quality which leads to resilience, food security, it reduces plant diseases um, but we're losing, as Craig said, soil um, through degradation. This photograph is from Sussex, but a larger version of it, I'll move on, we'll see in a moment or two. Um, very quickly, I'd say in order of priority, the cause of climate change are primary fossil fuels and we, everyone knows that uh, carbon dioxide is mostly coming from fossil fuels. What they don't realise is that even most methane is coming from fossil fuels. We, we see these films like Cowspiracy, but if you add together the methane that's coming from coal, oil and um, natural gas extraction and use, it's slightly higher than the methane that's coming from, from, from farm animals. Um, there's a separate aspect of them about that, which is that farming systems which are built based on fossil fuel fertilizers uh, using eight tons of eight, eight tons of carbon dioxide equivalents going to the atmosphere for every ton of nitrogen fertilizer used. Um, they are putting in fossil fuel carbon in the atmosphere, whereas grazing animals put back recycled carbon. A grazing animal can't put more carbon into the atmosphere than it takes out in the plants it eats. And that's been um, taken very recently from the atmosphere due by photosynthesis, carbon dioxide plus water produces the carbohydrates, as Clay, Clay explains. So ruminants can't actually increase the amount of methane or the amount of carbon dioxide. The methane breaks back down to carbon dioxide and water after about a decade. But while it is methane, it does, it's quite true, have a, a global warming impact and it's higher than most people um, quote. The latest figures from the United Nations about 28 times that of carbon dioxide. And if you look at it over a short period of time, rather than 100 years, which arguably you should do, it's about 80 times more powerful. Um, the secondary cause is ag soil degradation and only about 10% of the carbon in the atmosphere has come from soils but it's still nevertheless significant. So the claims that we can completely solve the climate change problem as, as people in the Savory Institute claim by putting back, by through carbon sequestration are, are in my view false but they, it, it's, it's something we should still be doing, but we also have to recognise that it's only a small part of the overall problem. But it's, for me, it's, it's also absolutely essential because if we go on degrading the soils, we won't be able to produce food at all. Um, we've got the methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions from livestock. We've got, the, as I mentioned, the fossil fuels used in power and fertiliser. Agricultural lime is another source of carbon dioxide. The calcium carbonate breaks down to carbon dioxide and other compounds. And ammonia from indoor livestock production. And indoor livestock production is the major source of ammonia, which is a problem with air pollution. But some of that breaks back down to nitrous oxide as well, and so it contributes to climate change. Uh, Craig has shown slides of uh, this. This is actually in Sussex, soil degradation in Sussex. We, this is why we've got people predicting we've only got 100 harvests less in the UK because some of our prime agricultural land are degraded. This is root uh, vegetable harvesting in, in a wet autumn, showing how much damage that's doing as well. A United Nations map showing that 52% of soils globally are now moderately or severely de degraded. The red are severely degraded, the amber moderately degraded. There are very few parts of the world where soil degradation hasn't become a problem. And we are losing, incredibly, we've got these figures right, 20, I think I know, 26 billion tonnes of soil a year are being lost through soil degradation and erosion, and that's equivalent to 3.4 tonnes of soil for every human on the planet being lost every year. Now, uh, I better rush through this, I'm going to run out of time. Um, this type of farming is really the sort of farming which is causing the major soil degradation, and if you look at this slide here, you'll see um, just the way the dust is being, this is what's happening in South America, um, corn production in South America, um, and, 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 and um, soybean production. Um, this is land which was, until about 30 years ago, farmed by small indigenous tribes in the Cerrado 
in South America. They were evicted by people like Cargills and so on, who, because they got no paper land rights. So they became the people who moved into the Amazon and, and, and burned bits of land and felled trees to try to find somewhere to feed their families. 200,000 had been kicked out by 1997. I don't know what the total figures were. Yeah, grassland was gone sequestering carbon, adding to the carbon after it's been established after arable land for maybe up to 100 years. The major, the major increase is taking place in the first 25 years, really. Cropland will go on, when you convert arable uh, grassland or forest to arable production, it will lose carbon for 50 to 100 years. Now, if it's a, a clay soil, it will stabilise then at a lower level, 40, 50, 60% loss of carbon, but it won't go on losing more carbon. If it's a sandy soil, it could go on making its way down to desert. And that's really where the statistics come from that uh, Craig was quoting, that we're losing so many football pitches a minute of land. It's something like 24 million ton, uh, eight hectares of land being lost every year to food production. Yeah, the bit I want to focus on is we've had these claims from the United Nations that livestock are responsible for 18% of global warming, then they revised that in 2013 to 14.5%. Actually, if you look at a second report, the same team published the same year, they actually they said, actually, those figures are a massive overestimate because we based them on 2005, when there was still a lot of rainforest being destroyed in South America, and we don't actually know what the figures would be at the present time. Um, and the point here is what they did, they only looked at land degradation, land use change in South America. And then they extrapolated those figures globally. That was completely inappropriate to do that because if you take a country like the UK, when rainforest was being destroyed to produce soybean oil, soybean oil for human consumption and soybean meal for human consumption and for livestock, intensive livestock, we were planting trees in the UK and we've actually been sequestering more carbon than we've been emitting in agriculture in the last few years in the UK. Um, UK agriculture, ignoring the import of fertilisers and import of livestock feed, which is predominantly soybean or soybean meal, um, UK agriculture is responsible for 9% of UK greenhouse gas emissions. So, in fact, if you take UK, ruminants in the UK and use the same methodology that the United Nations use, which is, is a skewed methodology, we're really only responsible for about 2% of emissions. In fact, if you do it and don't include the carbon that's been sequestered in grassland and, and forests, it's about 5 to 6%. Now that's significant, but it's not quite as scary as Cowspiracy, which told everybody that ruminants were putting 51% of the, were responsible for 51% of global warming. And just to finish with, if we take um, methane here, this is a, I'm not sure this, this is the, perhaps the best one, it's done in a bit of a hurry. Um, there are, this is showing 7% for agriculture, 15% for land use change. And this is really where these, dramatic statistics come from is when you're felling rainforest to produce farmland that you get these, these high levels because you can lose 50% of your carbon in five years um, in that sort of situation and huge amounts from the trees that are being lost. So my, art, my su suggestion <coughs> is it's a huge challenge. Um, there's one more point I do need to make. Uh, oh yes, this is prairie grass. This is showing why grassland is good at sequestering. The roots went down 20 feet uh, prairie grass that, that Craig's ancestors were ploughing up probably in Nebraska. Um, and and the, the reason we're getting these various results with soil carbon is because... The, let me see if I can find the slides. Sorry, down there. Sorry, this is Rothamsted research showing that if you put grass, if you if you put grass to convert grass down to cropland here, you will lose carbon for about 40 years. The blue line coming down. If you take cropland and um, and put it into grassland, you'll increase carbon. If you actually here have um, arable land that's already lost a lot of carbon and go on farming it, you're not really changing things very much. Now this is not including adding organic matter in in the term of return to our farmyard manure. This is just grassland, so you will get about a 15% increase in the soil carbon over a, but over a long period of time. And the claims from the United can I find yes here in 2000 in 1992. Some scientists called Poston West 
reviewed all the studies on carbon sequestration and crop production. And they claimed that taken together, that minimum tillage would add over half a tonne of carbon per year to soils. Now that suited Monsanto and others very nicely, um, and it, it made it look as if we could solve this problem. And that led to some of these quotes from the United Nations and the EU and others that agriculture is going to be able to solve this problem. However, Rotham said research scientists here and three other teams of scientists who I could give you papers from if you want them have actually shown that we're not sequestering that much carbon in these systems. Even where you get a small increase in topsoil, you actually get a loss in the subsoil, and so there's actually no net increase in, in carbon sequestration. Only grassland can actually solve the problem we face. Thank you. So, well, what I was going to tell you about was really about not so much the fact, I mean, everybody knows I'm a compost freak, and, and I would go on and talking about compost from here to eternity, but I'm not going to this morning, because, I want to tell you about the sort of challenges and the problems that I see uh, we face in <clears throat> trying to change the direction of travel for producing food, particularly horticultural crops, in the world today. I started uh, back in the early 70s and I was attracted to the Soil Association because of the philosophy which stated the relation to the need to investigate the relationship between animal, plant, and soil and man, and that that relationship created a health um, that was beneficial for the whole of society. Now, I then went on a journey uh, at, at a small horticultural unit in West Wales for some years, starting in 1974, and. I wasn't really a sort of animal person, I wasn't really a, a, a biodiversity person, but, but I was, I always had an innate love for the soil. I just wanted to touch it and feel it and work with it and see it better. And I saw enormously inconsistent results in what I was doing. I read all the books, I followed all my heroes, some of you will know them, friends, Sykes and all sorts of other well-known organic people in, in, in the 30s and the 20s and the 40s and I made a mess of an awful lot of it <laughs> and I did my manures, I tried to compost uh, uh, in a very bad way but then I got better and better I thought I did until really we came across a really decent way of composting and that has informed all the work we do since so when I talk about compost I mean a thermophilic process uh, that is basically feeding the soil with health, the potential to develop health rather. We want to feed the soil with microorganisms to develop the protective and immunological systems that will give resilience to our crop protection systems. It will also bring other benefits as well. It will bring some nutrition, it will stabilize carbon, it will help on water and other things besides. But that journey also coincided with uh, the other part of what I want to talk about today, which was how we saw the crops. And I've been on a journey for the last 40 years, which started off selling everything locally, went on to selling everything nationally through supermarkets, and has come back to selling everything locally through farmers markets. And the reason for that last part primarily is because I've got older. Uh, we have kids who are now entering into the farm business. And I wanted to try to see whether Anne and I could leave a model of a food production system, if it was possible, that was meeting all the parameters that we felt were important as human beings providing food for other people. And so that model required us to restrict the distribution chain to as local as possible for obvious reasons. It required us to buy in as little as possible, aiming towards zero but being pragmatic about it as little as possible. 
it meant recycling everything we possibly could in the most qualitative way imaginable through the composting system to feed the basis of life, the soil, which would feed the environment around us. And to see if we could do that, because it also meant that we had to provide a diet, a basic diet for people, because there was no point in doing this and just producing a bit of food, and that was great for us and a few other people. We wanted to see, how, we live in a community that's very small. In West Wales, as you can see from here onwards, I'm about 40 minutes from here. Uh, there's only a few people. I mean, our, my village is 300 people. Uh, my, my megapolis in Aberystwyth is 10,000 people. Uh, you know, you were talking, so it's very difficult to produce large quantities of perishable crops and sell them within these other parameters. So the only alternative was to take as much of the food basket, the food shopping basket, of those few people as we could and benefit from that. But that meant that they, we had to persuade them not to buy in their vegetables from Spain and um, everywhere in the winter. They had to buy as local as possible. So therefore we had to provide that range of vegetables <coughs> and salads throughout the year as much as possible. And to do that, we had to build greenhouses and things like that because we needed some protection. And we had to do all that greenhouse work without heat without additional sort of supplement of support. And that was a journey that we went on a few years ago. That's a journey we're on now, and it will be a journey we're on for some considerable time, and the details of which I'll go into later. But that sort of fitted into my other work, which when I looked in the early part of the, the, in the middle of the 1990s, um, the, the beginnings of carbon, uh, climate change, carbon sequestration, all these other histories. And you started studying all this. We came to a number of different conclusions. And maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, we can discuss them. Globally, we have enough potential to produce food for people. We have not the right diet for everybody, so that's an issue. Secondly, we do not recycle everything that we can recycle. And primarily, the main thing about that is uh, vegetable waste and other organic materials, which are still incinerated in many European countries. <coughs> uh, we could certainly fuel the horticultural areas of Europe with the recycled, properly composted plant wastes. But we also have the very, very tricky issue of human manures that if we want to close the cycle as much as possible, which we need to, we have to address properly the qualitative use of human sewage. At the moment it's all used, it's not usually dumped or anything or incinerated particularly, but it's just used for inappropriate purposes. So we have to do all that and have our diet based on the principle of eating less and eating better. I mean, I think these are well-known uh, essences. And from our perspective, Richard mentioned a little bit of that towards it. I mean, this country, I mean, if you think about it, agriculture depends on society for its financial survival. It's all survival. If you're going to have money from your customers, then you have to give them some benefit. And we don't give them really very much benefit. One benefit we can give them is make agriculture a net carbon negative function. And why would you do that? Well, if we're going to have, uh, achieve carbon neutrality as a nation, as, as a country, as a world, then you, some areas of industrial production are going to be positive. So some are going to have to, de facto, become negative. And I would always say that agriculture should put its hand up to elect to go on a journey towards carbon negativity because that's what they can do. And they would do that by a number of different ways, some of which I mentioned in recycling of all ways, but primarily by planting more and more trees and hedgerows. 
I mean, Richard mentioned it on one of his slides, I mean, this incredible thing, Steiner talked about it a long time ago, that when you look at the, the, the tree in the field, imagine it upside down. Just imagine it, because there is more matter underneath the ground than shows above the ground. And that, in addition to that, all those fine root hairs and all the bacteria and biota that survive on that root system is an enormous density and mass. And we could m make a huge contribution to the climate situation if we did that with hedgerows. I mean, it's just phenomenal what you can do it, apart from the biodiversity. So that's the sort of really the background to the journey that I've, that I've got. And to achieve that, we've got to commercially survive uh, the crops that we're growing, uh, as I mentioned. But if I'm honest, we're facing sort of a huge, huge battle, and everyone knows it. There's a, I would think, a body of opinion, which, I, if I'm honest, almost a, from an intellectual point of view, is winning the argument that it's probably better to produce much more intensively with every single tool in the box on less land than to have extensive food production. Now, all of us would disagree with that uh, proposal, of course, and give very good reasons. And I believe that that argument will, will fail in the long run. I think it has no great sucker. But you can't take it for, for granted. And we have to find ways of bringing the consumer, the public, the citizen, into wanting to buy, not having to buy out of a, a conscience that they, I must buy those organic tomatoes because that's good for the planet. Sob it. I mean, it, they want to buy things that are good for them. They have to buy through pure self-interest. And we have to educate their self-interest. It may be water, better water uh, opportunities for the planet by buying our food. It may be health, it may be environment, it may be all sorts of different reasons. And then we have to explore and develop and articulate all these different points. But we have to also bring it into something that's round. And this is where I, as I said in the beginning of my uh, talk with you, this is where I struggle. And I don't have an answer because I watch our people coming, to, uh, our customers coming to the farmers markets, and they are just extraordinary. The commitment and the loyalty that they bring to us—I mean, it's just beyond. And I ask myself, why is that? What, it, what is motivating people to do this? It's not that the prices are attractive. That I'm sure the taste is good, but what is it? Now, I don't know, but for me, my journey about it is when I look at the soil and I work with the soil and I work with the plants, I increasingly only plant using Matthias Tune, it used to be Maria Tune, the sun does it now, planting calendar. And I think that cosmic rhythm that the prince talked about yesterday, those rhythms that have informed agriculture all over the world since forever. People planted by phases of the moon and uh, juxtaposition of those planets, and they did that intuitively. We uh, have been doing this for quite a long time, and I can't prove anything about it at all. But it feels good, it works, and the quality of the food seems to be of a, a dimension that brings a real attraction with my, my, my public. And I think that's something we need to do, which is also where I started, is where I'm finishing for the rest of my life, is still exploring the relationship between the soil, plant, animal, and man, and the health created by that connection. Thank you. Thank you, and it's really good to, to finish on that sense of much more questioning and what is it that people want and how do we 
offer people what they do want and why do they care about food and the land? And I think some of those questions are really important because we know the facts, but how do we actually get people to engage? I'm going to ask the other panellists to come and sit here and for people to um, contribute in whatever way they want, not just to ask questions, but if you've got points you'd like to make. If they're questions, please say so and who you'd like to answer them. But if you've just got something you'd like to say, then please do. There are microphones. And could you just say who you are, just in case we don't all know each other? Thank you. Hardy Walkman. One addition is nobody talked about more lands. Because you know there's 40% of the carbon of this world and 25% of nitrogen. And the vegetable growers use quite a lot of that. Germany imports 900 million cubic meters per year. We have a Moland Protection Act in Germany, but we import it from the Baltic and from Russia. So that is one of the problems we have to face and we have to think about no more drainage of moorlands, which also happens in Asia to produce afterwards um, palm oil. So that's number one. We have to stop certain things immediately. Secondly, we have to think about farming systems. The examples we saw the wrong farming systems. So that means we have to improve the farming systems. Number one, crop rotation, integration of animal and plant production. And then we can talk about certain inputs. And the number one input for us in Germany, and I started in 1982, was separate collection of organic waste from households. Closing regional nutrient cycles. That was the idea. And it worked, and it's now compulsory in all of the EU. So this is one option to really close the carbon cycle locally. Proper farming system, crop rotation, integration, and then we get this. And what you were pointing out about food quality, maybe it's a self-organizing principle. And what we have to do in farming is to reactivate this self-organizing principle. And just to talk about carbon is very dangerous. We have not only two forms of carbon. We have about 12. And maybe Bioshar is just dead carbon, just for the physical structure of the soil, and not live carbon like you have from compost. And that's the big difference. And I, unfortunately, I've never seen, and maybe Craig, you have it, replicated trials to show really the effects of biochar compared to compost, starting with the organic matter. How much do you lose? How much do you need to produce it? Compared to compost, I'm quite certain compost will be the winner. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to respond to that, either from the audience or from the panel? You can't compare biochar and compost. They go together. They aren't, uh, it isn't one against the other. It's one amplifying the benefit of the other. All the biology in the compost that you put into the soil is food for protozoa, mites, nematodes, and it's part of that cycle of life. When you have biochar, you protect the biology that you've cultured in the compost, and so you have an increase of all that uh, microbiology in the soil as a result of having the biochar. Yes, biochar is 100% dead, but it is the framework that supports all the life that you have in compost. And just for clarity, the term moorlands that Hardy was using is peatlands. So it's peat that we have to stop using. And we have been campaigning for years within the Soil Association to stop the permitted use of peat in organic systems, which frankly is a disgrace in any organic farming system across Europe, and yet, as you pointed out, in Germany it's allowed, in Britain it's allowed, and biochar is a very effective way of replacing some of the functionality of peat. So that's my response to your... Um, I did some calculations a few years ago um, for a chapter that was published in a book called The Meat Crisis, in where I actually compared the um, methane emissions uh, from ruminants 
um, from memory, um, a, a, a typical beef animal, an adult beef animal, produces something like 48 kilograms of methane a year, and another two to four kilograms are produced from the manure if it's intensively farmed, and um, a bit less if it's, if, it's, if it's grazing all the time. A dairy cow can produce over 100 kilograms, because they're, but then their, their output is much higher. Um, the carbon sequestration um, from uh, grassland, now this is where it gets complicated because it a lot depends on what the, the, the typical carbon, carbon content of the soil is because when you talk about percentage increases, if you've got a sandy soil with only 0.02% carbon or something like that and then you increase it by a certain percentage, you're not getting a huge amount of carbon. If you've got a fairly peaty soil with maybe up to 10% carbon, like some parts of Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland are very rich in, in, in carbon in that way, a percentage increase could be very substantial. Uh, what I showed was that um, taking a typical English type soil for, uh, and take an arable field and convert it to grassland, the, uh, the, 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 it will go on adding significant amounts of carbon for about 25 years. There's, a, there's one study by a French scientist who's behind this 4 per thousand issue, Jean Francois Susanna. And he, he's actually found on nine sites with 48 separate sets of data across Europe, including one from the UK, net carbon sequestration of 760 kilograms per hectare per year. Now, most, a lot of people think that's very, very high. Um, a lot of studies have found lower levels than that. But what he's showing is it's a lot to do with the management. And if you've got, he, he shows that if you've got um, up to 0.8 livestock units per hectare and you're not adding back manure then you're getting net carbon neutrality with livestock. If, you, if you're adding manure you can go up to 1.2 parts per kilogram, uh, 1.2 livestock units per hectare uh, and, and still get carbon neutrality. Um, so how long that continues I don't know but for the time being it looks possible. I can't really comment intelligently on topping off, but I imagine you're putting a lot of quite carbon rich material because it's seed heads and flower heads into the soil. So that sounds like a good thing, but I'll bow to Richard's judgment on that. On the question of the carbon tax, Richard pointed out that it takes eight tons of fossil fuel carbon to produce one ton of nitrate fertilizer. So arguably, you don't really need a nitrate tax if you've got a carbon tax, because the impact on the nitrate price of eight tons of carbon is going to be quite adequate to push up the price of nitrate and therefore push down the usage of it as a fertilizer. The reason that we, we we're rather backing the idea of a nitrogen tax in, in farming rather than a carbon tax is because it's extremely difficult to measure carbon in the field. There are three different techniques and even if two groups of scientists went into the same field they wouldn't necessarily come up with the same results because carbon levels can vary across the field quite significantly. The point about nitrogen is something the farmers have to buy the European Nitrogen Assessment, which involved 230 European scientists, published in 2011, calculated that the cost that society pays for the use of nitrogen fertiliser across Europe are up to 230 billion euros a year in terms of the negative impacts. Now, it was between 30 and 230. There's a, a huge range in their, in their calculations because they've got a lot of unknowns in there but whatever the cost it's a very very large amount and what it really shows is that actually society pays up to three times more than the commercial benefits the farmers get from using nitrogen so as you have to buy the nitrogen we think if you if you only have to add a very small tax to actually encourage farmers to use less or use it more constructively or to encourage them to use legumes instead which would be the ideal solution hi phil horton better food um, it was really a, a comment um, from your talk, Peter. Um, it struck me that what you've done at Blind Camel and the produce that you sell, the reason that people are drawn to it and are such fabulous customers is because it truly shines brightly. 
and it is uh, it's a healing power uh, that 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 people are seeing and feeling without even knowing. And this is the fabulousness of really, really strong connection. And I'm really interested in, in this conference because it's, it's that harmony that you're creating there, which is affecting somebody's life deeply, even without necessarily being conscious of it, I believe. Um, and that in a way our work here and in the world is, is surely about connection um, at every level, so the, the, the microbes to the vegetables to the plates to the, to the human relationship and that, that really is the most powerful, powerful journey that we can, that we can move on. Um. Uh, briefly, that, uh, I absolutely agree with you and that's why after all these years I, I, I I spend my time sort of trying to persuade governments and, and things to do something. You get nowhere by, by and large. You get promises, but actually not. Well. In some countries, you have. In this country, not. Uh, so the only way forward, it, the NFU message is going to become, as I alluded to, much more about intensification. And it, it, that's the direction of travel, and you won't change it, except if the public changes it. And that's all it's all about. That's what Hugh said. People like him need to be replicated a million fold uh, all over the country with a message. But my point was, what message? And we won't come to an agreement on that either. And you won't come to an agreement on the science of, of soil, the sequestration. I've tried for years and years and years. I have a whole LCA thing on the farm for 10 years now. And it shows that we are carbon negative, and it takes every parameter into consideration. We can talk about it when you come to the farm today. But uh, nobody really cares. They care about their direction of travel, and the only thing that will change them is a political change. It's politics, and the politics will be determined by the people, and that's what's going to move. So I'll answer that question, and I'll deliver my closing remarks. So yes, there are simple and more accessible technologies for doing that that have much, much lower emissions than the traditional pit or ring kiln burning systems. Uh, some of them are very clever. Contiki is one to remember, and carbon gold also make a kiln that reduces emissions by 90% and increases the yield by about uh, 80 to 100%. Just my closing remarks, we, I have been involved in promoting and selling organic food for 50 years. Every time you have a discussion with anybody about the actual facts of organic versus industrial agriculture, organic wins the argument. There's no problem there. And we can continue to exhort people to see the light and to understand the logic of organic, but I'm, you know, I despair because when people go into a shop and buy that bunch of bananas or bunch of carrots or box of cornflakes, they look at the price. To try and win the argument on a rational level is impossible. The only way we can win the argument is to make people pay for the damage that carbon and nitrogen, nitrates are doing to the environment. Just one, I'll just make one comment really, which is, I think it probably is possible to produce vegetables in a carbon neutral way, particularly if you do it like Peter. Um, I think what we forget is that most people eat a lot of cereals, they also eat a lot of vegetables, they eat a lot of protein, and it's very difficult to produce protein, whether it's from soybean oils in South America or from livestock products in the UK, that's completely carbon neutral. But nature's very forgiving. Uh, 99 point some six or something like that percent of all methane that's produced is broken down by natural sinks. We don't need to reduce methane emissions overall by less of one percent to en end up seeing methane levels in the atmosphere coming down e every year rather than still going up. And the same thing with carbon. We really the major thing task is still to move away from using fossil fuels. 
uh, to using renewable energy. The main reason that we need to put carbon back in the soil, it, it, will have a, it will help with the atmosphere. The main reason is because soils that have lost their carbon uh, have lost their organic matter, and if they've lost their organic matter, they're not going to be resilient to climate change and they're not going to be able to produce food in the future. I would like to leave you with just uh, uh, the thought on a slightly different level that we need to get carbon back into the soil for all these re obvious reasons but please remember that the science of epigenetic genetics is developing at an incredible rate and the knowledge of the human body and its needs and its components in terms of uh, bio biology general the microbiota is almost identical in principle to the potential functioning of the soils with the fungi and the bacteria in its diversity and density. And if we can create soils that are diverse, we can produce food that will benefit humans, that will increase their ability to develop their own immune system. So putting carbon back into the soil is a health preventative process and critical one.